Next, a stately manor becomes a beloved community gathering space. Then, Broad Street, a home to the wealthy and influential. And later, a mansion in Chillicothe with ties to the formation of Ohio. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain, and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Driving through any city or small town, you'll probably come across some beautiful old mansions and estates and wonder about their history. I know I have. Well, you're in luck, Charlene, because today we're exploring the history of some of those big old houses, starting off with a 52-acre estate in historic Grantville. Now, how's that for big? That sounds pretty big. And who better to find out more than architectural historian Jeff Darby? The Licking County village of Granville was settled in 1805, pretty early, two years after Ohio became a state. It's a town with some wonderful historic architecture, churches and commercial buildings. There are two historic inns, the Buxton Inn from 1812, the Granville Inn from 1924. But one of the best buildings in town is known as Brindu Mansion. Brindu is Welsh for Black Hill, uh, probably named because of the density of the trees on the hillsides around. So we're going to visit today, uh, learn about the history of the place and how it's used how it was preserved, and I think we're going to have a pretty good time. Hello! Welcome! Hello, Bruce. Thank you. How are you? Welcome to Brindu. Thanks so much. Every time I come to town and drive by here, I just it's such a wonderful place. We, we me, love it too. Tell me a little about the story. Well, it's, it's an interesting story. Um, an Italianate structure was built here in 1865. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jones built this structure that we see now, kind of inclusive and on top of and surrounding okay. that well, structure. Well, let's have a tour. Yeah, let's come on in. Oh, nice hallway. <laughs> Thank you. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, and an even better room. Oh well, my gosh, this look at was this. the Jones family living room. Look at the trim, the detail, the ornamental ceiling, the Isn't woodwork. Great? What a great space. Two fireplaces. Um, this is all mahogany on this side of the house. Wow. Well, tell me about Mr. Jones. He Mr. obviously was pretty well off. Mr. Jones made his fortune in railroads and coal. Mm -hmm. And um, he used to live in a house downtown Granville. But I guess the urban downtown Granville must have I got to get out of there. Too noisy and crowded. Yeah, so <laughs> he bought this place, which was an Italianate structure, and, and then built the wings and built everything. That so it's an adaptation see. of an earlier building. It is. It, probably yes. from, what, the 1850s or 60s? 1865 okay. is the date okay. we have for that. The well, ceiling is incredible in here, and you notice. Well, it's molded plaster, isn't they it? They call it an Adams ceiling. Yes, the Brothers Adam, the English uh, designers from the 18th century. Right. So not a lot of people can repair this. No, I imagine We not. had to have some work done in here. And, um, this is not quarter-inch drywall. This no, it's not. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's more. Oh, yeah. Uh, shall we continue the Let's tour? Let's see the rest of the house. Well, Jeff, now we are in the Jones family dining room. With well, a fireplace, of course. Of course. To, to set the right atmosphere. In the old days, uh, underneath this rug, there was a little wire that Mrs. Jones would tap a button, and through these beautiful mahogany doors mm -hmm. was the butler pantry. So the okay. butler would, of course, serve the meal or serve the next course. And uh, these were doors to the kitchen then. Yes. So kitchen, butler pantry, side by side. Right. Uh, right access direct to the dining room. It's a generously proportioned dining room, double doors going back into the hallway and the, and the living room. Triple doors headed out to the, the porch. Aren't they nice? And the, uh, the rear entrance. A lot of light. 
Yeah, a lot of natural light. It was well thought out. So uh, yeah, this is this is very nice with the formal sort of formal spaces in the house. But I'm sure there were informal spaces, more casual spaces. Oh yes, shall we? Well, I think it's a good idea. Well, this is the east wing of the house, Jeff. Oh, this is a, a library then, a small library. Mm -hmm. Beautiful with the fireplace and quarter sawn oak wood. That's very nice space. Nice. It's a great little room. Yeah, it's very nice. But, and that leads us into the bar. Oh, look at this. Now that looks like a real ice box, like a box for ice to keep things cool. Is that well, right? Well, it may have been at the time, but now it's an actual refrigerator and it's cool in there. And we wow. use it. That, that's great. That, now, this is as it was when, when the village acquired the building? It was. Wow. And this room? On the original uh, Frank Packard plan, this was the billiard room. Oh, well, of course. So, it's, it's the right shape and proportion for yep. a billiards table. So if this was the billiard room, that was maybe the study, this was the bar. I'm thinking this was the man cave of Well, that's why the bar's next door. Right? Yeah, the, the bar, the billiard room, they go together. Sure they do. <laughs> Coming, moving on, is our East Solarium. Ah, the sunroom. Yes. Okay, so yes. the idea being get the morning sun here, and then there's a west one for afternoon sun. Mm -hmm. The idea that sun is good for you, but you don't have to be out in the weather. Well, I, well, you know, I don't know what they did in 1905. But. Well, I notice it has a really fine original tile floor. It's funny, um, th this tile floor on the other side, the tiles are blue, mm. and, and here they're red. Hmm. And um, so, like, why, did, why is there some significance to that? I don't know. Sunrise, sunset, something like that. Okay, let's go with that. So there's more to the house, more stories. There's an upstairs. There is. There are three floors on the, in the mansion. And we can see those, too? Let's take a walk and right. let's, we'll see them. Now we're going to the third floor. No one gets to come up here. Well, for me, the forbidden spaces are the best. That's right. That's what I thought. <laughs> Come on in. These were all bedrooms, probably. Oh, sure. Yeah, you can see with the fireplaces and so on. Up here, there were a bathroom that would serve as two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And then a bathroom that would serve as two bedrooms. And then a big uh, kind of an open space. When did the Jones family leave the property and how did it end up in village ownership? The uh, Jones family left, Sally left in the mid to late 70s. A guy purchased it. I think he put a restaurant in here for a while. I remember that, yes. And then, and then a company called Quest bought it. Quest is a, was a curriculum writing company. This was their world headquarters. Wow. They were in here for 10 years or so. Okay. They sold it to Dave Longeberger. Oh, the basket guy. The basket guy, but four years later he died. Right, I remember when that happened. It sat empty until 2003 and the village of Granville said, we can't let this go away. It's a heck of a resource. Yeah, so they bought it, they developed a 501c3 nonprofit mm -hmm. corporation to operate it. Mm -hmm. It tied very closely in with the village. And, and so all the money that comes in through various ways stays here and, and our mission is to keep it, keep it happening, keep it viable. So do you have plans for the spaces here on the third floor? There are several rooms. Not specifically. We're still working through that. So they're sort of banked for future use. Yeah. But I know the second floor, you have done some work. Oh, um, yeah. I think your offices are there. Can we take a look at that level Let's as well? Let's go down to two. Okay. So this is the second floor of the mansion. And you can see that there is a lot of space up here that is not usable. A definite mix of uh, finished and unfinished. Yep, it's a, and then we're heading toward the spaces we can use up here on the second floor. It's a little spooky and uh, ooky like the Adams family house. Well, we hope not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at this. I mean, what a room this is. Now, Isn't that the, the great? shelving here, the bookshelves, are, are these, these are pictures of things that you do here, weddings and that sort of thing? Yes, okay. we, do, we do a lot of community things. Uh, we do weddings and, and family gatherings, um, all things like that that help, help sustain us. So go through the sorts of things you, you do here, the, 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 how well, the house serves. In, in the springtime, um, we have our Granville Garden Club Daffodil Show, 
flowers everywhere. In March, we have our art show. The entire first floor is filled with art from not only all over the state, but there are all over the, all over the country. Mm -hmm. In the uh, summertime, of course, on our great lawn is uh, polo, uh, which is fun. Uh, behind us, we have our art center. So we do art classes, kids through adults and everything in between, all different mediums. So we try to be educational, cultural, and recreational, all of those things on the 52 acres. Well, what a great chance this has been to learn about Brindu and how it's developed over time once the village acquired it and how you use it today. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Next, a look at Broad Street in its heyday. And then, a tour of Adena Mansion and Gardens in Chillicothe. If you're driving along East Broad Street in Columbus, there are some beautiful old houses there. Some are residential, but most are businesses, like the Columbus Foundation behind us. Before it was the Columbus Foundation, though, it was built for a prominent businessman, and it was home to 10 Ohio governors. So the Broad Street we know today is definitely not the Broad Street that our forefathers knew. It was where the movers and shakers at that time built houses with the best resources that money could buy. As the developing city pushed east, certain streets started taking shape. Livingston Avenue on the south, Main Street, which was part of the National Road, and Broad Street, the road to Granville, and the beginning of a premier residential boulevard. Broad Street, in a sense, is the sort of Victorian dream street. And persons who are really well off in the city of Columbus tend to build their dream houses out along the East Broad Street corridor. It was the creme de la creme for those who were the well-to-do in building houses, which were really monuments to their own success back in the turn of the last century. They wanted to make Broad Street coming into downtown Columbus a show place, so they built the finest houses they could design and conceive and afford. These homes later became what we might say are a vanity houses. At the time these buildings were built, it was a broad avenue. It had tree islands in the middle of the street, so it was a very graceful, very refined, very beautiful boulevard and it was one of the main entrances into the city of Columbus, so it was a very, very important street. Broad Street became home to some of the most influential people in Columbus. People like Frederick Schumacher, famous for inventing testimonial advertising for the elixir Peruna. My grandmother took Peruna and she felt better. The horse drank Peruna, he feels better, the dog has it. You know, my great grandmother, it cured everything. Later in his life, Schumacher donated his art collection, which is the basis for the present day Columbus Museum of Art on Broad Street. And Broad Street was home not only to the wealthy, but the important. For years, Ohio governors had a Broad Street address. Originally, Ohio governors didn't really have a mansion through most of the 19th century, through the 1800s. They lived in all sorts of places. By the 20th century, it became apparent that it would be nice, like most other states do, to have a governor's mansion. So the Lindenburg Mansion, having been built in 1905, was acquired by the state of Ohio to become the governor's mansion. And it will serve as the governor's mansion through the 1920s, well down into the 1950s, when a new governor's mansion is acquired in Bexley. Next, the estate built by a man considered to be the father of Ohio statehood. And then, Curious Sea Bus takes a look at the smaller side of life. You know, Javier, since this show is all about big houses, I figured this would be a great time to go visit one myself. Oh yeah, where'd you go? To the Adena Mansion and Gardens in Chillicothe, and wow, did it exceed my expectations. Hi, how are you? Hi, welcome to Adena Mansion and Gardens. Thank this you. is the home of Thomas Worthington. Beautiful. I am Kathy and this is Renata. Hi Renata, nice She'll to meet you. She'll be your docent today and I will let her give you the house tour and I will catch up with you in the garden. Oh, terrific, thank you so much. All right. All right, Renata, let's go. Let's go. The house was built between 1806 and 1807. It was designed by Benjamin Henry Latrobe, who was the first professional American architect. 
Okay, Charlene, I will show you the oh, house. Beautiful. And uh, this is the grand entry. Thomas Worthington was the sixth governor of Ohio, and over the mantel is his gubernatorial portrait. Some of the furniture actually belonged to the Worthingtons, like, for example, that tall clock over there. If you look around the baseboard, for example, you might think that is marble. It is not. What is it? It is black walnut that has been grain painted to look like marble. One thing I noticed, Renata, as soon as I got in, the doors are low. Ah, that is an optical illusion. They are 6'4", and they look so low because the ceilings are 12-foot ceilings. This is the master bedroom, and I prefer to call it mom's room because toward the end of her life, Eleanor spent an awful lot of time in this room. Really? And with 10 kids and a husband hardly ever home, the woman had to have a place to go and chill. This is one of the two window doors we have. She could lift up the middle part of that window, open the bottom part, and take a couple of steps into her garden. How yes. clever. Now, this is Eleanor's office, Mrs. Worthington's office. She called it her parlor. And in this room, she not only entertained her many lady friends, Eleanor spent a lot of time here managing the farm along with her brother James. What kinds of things would she have needed to do? And I'm guessing this kind of she desk is where she would sit. She would have kept books. In this room, she also would have worked with the cook on the plans for the meals. Worthingtons were very sociable people. The house was always full of guests. We're going into the drawing room, and it is called that because people withdrew into this room after they ate in the state dining room. Thank you. I had no idea why a drawing room was called that. Shortly after the Worthingtons moved into the house in the fall of 1807, Tecumseh and several of his warriors came to visit. Imagine Tecumseh being here along with Blue Jacket, with Roundhead, with Panther, and just chit-chatting with the Worthington. This is one of the two rounders we have. It is basically a door with a swivel in the center. And the idea was to load it up with after dinner refreshment, then turn it, and it only took one servant to take care of the guests in this room. And you said they were very social, so they would very. have had a lot of people yes. circulating through here. Anybody who was somebody in the early days of Ohio would have gathered here, the, the business people, the politicians. Next is the uh, state dining room. Oh, beautiful. Their table had seating for 22 dinner guests. This is one of the two sideboards that belong to them. This one is the original, the other one is a replica. This is and gorgeous. this is Thomas Worthington's wedding portrait. He is 23 years old and he has white hair because he greased it and he powdered it. Anything to look older and more dignified. That is hilarious. Now everybody's trying to look young, young, young. Yes, not back then. This is uh, Thomas Worthington's office. He called it his study. Ohio became a state in 1803, and he was the driving force behind Ohio becoming a state. So he was then governor um, between 1814 and 1816. And for his first term as governor, this is where he did his work. And his very chair and his travel desk. So this is our, our history. I mean, I'm almost picturing him sitting yes. here and yes. writing, yes. reading, working on whatever yes. it is. On the mantle, it was his most prized possession. That ceremonial sword is rumored to go all the way back to the Revolutionary War, and it belonged to his father, Robert Worthington. Oh, my. The best thing I saved for last, and those are Thomas Worthington's Kentucky Long Rifles. Now, he was a very poor shot. So his manservant, <laughs> Moses, who always traveled with him, would be the one to take care of the business. Well, Renata, Thank this you. has been a fabulous tour. Thank you very much for visiting. Kathy, that is a fantastic house. I just, I can't wait to see the gardens now. The Worthingtons would have used the gardens as an entertainment area. <gasps> this is gorgeous. Mrs. Worthington, on their trip here, she dug up a wild rose. It was a pink rose, and there's not any of that variety with us today, but it's known as the Worthington Rose. It's unfortunate that Mrs. Worthington's diaries, um, we lost them in a fire. We know that they had a garden, and we know that there were three tiers to it. 
We know a lot of the flowers and ornamental plants would have come from things they saw, like Mrs. Worthington finding her rose on her trip here. But some of them are what would be considered a weed, but they're absolutely beautiful. The big yellow plants there are a form of a sunflower. Uh -huh. The plant there with the purple flowers, that is actually citronella. It's so beautiful. if you touch it, it smells like citronella. Well, let's just do that. Yep, that's citronella. This is lamb's ear. Uh-huh. Some of the stuff in the garden will dry because we have a wreath workshop at Christmas time. So we're making holiday wreaths. With in lamb's ear is and part of it. And we use everything from the grounds. The um, vegetable garden is in the next terrace. We gather them and we put them out for people to take for donation. And then whatever's left at the end of the week, we take to the local food pantry. Here is asparagus. I don't know if you've ever seen an asparagus plant. This is huge. Oh, look at the tomatoes and the corn. Yes. Wow. And we try to plant where we're having something come off all seasons. Do you actually do gardening here the way in the same manner we it try. might have been done? We try an organic farm. We're not certified organic or anything like that because they would not have used chemicals. No. They would have had the bugs. And so this is the second level. This is what we would call the kitchen garden. So you have the ornamental garden, uh -huh. the kitchen garden, and now we're going to step down into the vineyard area. This is a beautiful spot with all the trees, so nice and shady and cool. Thomas yeah. Worthington, did he plant any of the trees? His oldest son, James, did plant an apple tree when he lived here. James Worthington and his family were the last Worthingtons to live here. James's tree is out in the field there, and it is producing apples. I see more trees out here at the end of the garden. They call that the grove area. These trees were planted in geometric shapes. And what kind of shapes would we see if we were looking down on There's this from the air? There's diamonds, circles, and squares, I believe. This has been beautiful. Is there anything else that we can see? Yes, I have one more thing that I think you'll enjoy. Okay, let's go. I can imagine it must have been just so calm and nice living here. When he named it Adina, he named it for a place for a remarkable delightfulness. Oh my goodness, look at this view. Yes, this is the inspiration for the Great Seal of Ohio. It's what we see on our driver's license, our birth certificates. It is gorgeous. I think everybody who can should just come and see this. It is yeah. so beautiful yeah. and so significant. Kathy, thank you. This has been a terrific tour. Appreciate you hosting us today. You're welcome. Thank you. Curious CBUS is WOSU's project where you submit your questions about our region, its people, or its history, and we assign a reporter or producer to investigate it. Columbus's historic German village neighborhood certainly has its fair share of stately mansions, but the area is better known for its small, cozy brick cottages. That leads to today's question from Sherry Ray. She wants to know, what is the smallest home in German village, and how many square feet is it? Now, the reason so many of the houses in German Village are small is that when the area was first populated, it was actually south of the city limits. The land was cheap and it was parceled into smaller lots that brick masons, brewery workers, and other German immigrants could afford in the mid 19th century. The area thrived for decades. Over a hundred years later, however, the neighborhood was in decline and under threat from demolition and new construction. But thanks to heroic preservation efforts and the creation of the German Village Society, the neighborhood was revitalized and designated as a historic district by the city. That means there are restrictions on what can be built. So homeowners devised creative ways to add more space to the historic buildings while preserving the unique character of the neighborhood. Though many homes have been added onto, some pristine cottages remain more or less as they were decades ago. Which brings us back to the question of the smallest house. While German Village is famous for brick, the smallest home is actually a quaint wooden cottage. 
According to county records, the house is just 504 square feet. Documents at the German Village Society show that the building was constructed around 1911. It spent its first few years as a doctor's office and became a residence and rental property in 1915, which it remains to this day. Do you have a question for Curious CBUS? Head to WOSU.org slash curious to submit your idea, vote on which question we should investigate next, and see what we've covered so far. Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you. Thank you.